Today I'm going to talk about coupling and decoupling capacitors. Coupling capacitors are used in a number of places. For example, we might find them in a simple small signal amplifier. I'll make one here with a transistor. Make a common emitter amplifier. And we have a microphone out here, which we need to connect to the amplifier. So the problem is we have DC voltages set up over here with these biasing resistors so that we have a voltage at this point which is appropriate so that when the microphone drives this voltage down it doesn't drive the transistor into cutoff and when it drives it up it doesn't drive it into saturation and we've talked about those in another video about small signal amplifiers but of course we have to have a coupling capacitor to isolate these DC voltages from the microphone which of course uh, with no sound produces no voltage but when it is being hit by sound it produces alternating current so we have alt alternating current over here and direct current over here and the coupling capacitor is there to isolate them. And of course, going to the next stage over here, we would have another coupling capacitor because we would have similar appropriate DC voltages over here and different DC voltages over here. So we have to have something to isolate those DC voltages from each other, but allowing the alternating current to go through. So AC from the microphone is able to go through. I show it going through from left to right. That's the signal direction. Of course, alternating current goes both directions. But as we know, a capacitor tends to pass alternating current and to block direct current. Now I want to focus on using test equipment and how we use coupling capacitors there. So let's say I want to look at the circuit with an oscilloscope. So I hook up an oscilloscope probe here trying to make something that looks something like an oscilloscope probe, which will have a ground connection going somewhere. And that oscilloscope may have an input impedance anywhere from around 50 ohms to one meg ohm, depending on how it's set up. So if I have this in a low impedance state, what's going to happen? Let's just say, um, well, let's just say I put that at a state where it's in 50 ohms. Let's get this out of the way and show what I'm actually doing here. I am putting a 50 ohm resistor between the collector of this transistor and ground. Do you think that's going to affect the biasing of the circuit? Yes, it will. And of course, when I move it over here, I have the same problem. I'm going to change the bias of the circuit. So what can I do? I can put a capacitor between the oscilloscope and the circuit that I'm testing. And once again, this would be a coupling capacitor to allow me to couple to the circuit and allow the AC signal, which I want to measure, go through that capacitor without the DC coming through this 50 ohm resistor. So what do we call that? We're loading the circuit. Remember that the circuit load is the final output of a circuit where we produce power. Well, we call this loading the circuit because we are now producing power in a place we don't want to. And what happens if you load a circuit? Of course, loading a circuit is putting a low impedance on the output or somewhere else. We're going to get a lot of current and that's going to typically cause, well, what do we have? We have a power source of some sort. We have a circuit output impedance, which goes in series with that. And here is our load. And so if that becomes a low impedance, I'm going to get more current through my output impedance. More current through my output impedance means more voltage drops. So whatever voltage I have here, I'm going to get something less than that voltage here. And the more current, the less voltage I'm going to get. Remember that from the basics of how electronic circuits work way back when we were talking about the fundamentals of DC circuits. So I do not want to be loading that circuit down because that's going to pull that voltage down and change the characteristics. So I'm going to put a coupling capacitor between my test equipment and that circuit. Now, what size capacitor should I use? A big one, yeah. one microfarad or better. 
We don't want to use an electrolytic capacitor because they're polarized, but some kind of a plastic film capacitor or ceramic capacitor if it's big enough. Uh, just something big, but there is a way to calculate what we should put there. And we can use our formula for figuring out the cutoff frequency of a filter and modify that to find out what capacitor we want. We want to create a circuit that has a cutoff frequency well below the lowest frequency we want to pass in the circuit. So let's take a look at the formula to figure out our cutoff frequency. This is for an RC filter. So the cutoff frequency is 1 over 2 pi times RC. And what we want to do is actually find out what C is. And we know that algebraically we can swap terms such as that. So we can take the capacitor and swap it over to this side for the frequency. So our capacitor will be 1 over 2 pi R times our cutoff frequency. But we want this capacitor to really have an impedance that's about one-tenth of what we would want at that cutoff frequency. So we're going to just put an F here. And just remember, we're going to use an F that's one-tenth of the lowest frequency we want to pass in our circuit. And of course, we're talking about impedance, so we'll just change that R to a Z. And there is a formula we can use to calculate our coupling capacitor. So let's say that the lowest frequency we want to pass is going to be... Let's say it's an audio frequency, so our lowest frequency we want to pass is 20 hertz. See how big of a capacitor we end up with here. So that will be 20 hertz, one-tenth of that, so that's going to be 2 hertz, is going to be our frequency. Let's just build our formula down here. So our frequency is going to be 2. And what's our impedance? Well, we don't know what our impedance is. We have to know the output impedance of the circuit. Let's say the circuit impedance is... Let's just say it's um, 100 ohms just for good measure. So there's our impedance and of course 2 pi. So our capacitance is going to be 6.28 times 100 times 2. Let's look this over again. Remember how we got these numbers. Of course 6.28 is 2 pi. It's 2 pi times the impedance times the frequency. We decided the frequency will be 1 tenth of 20 hertz. So that's 2 hertz. I'll just put that 20 hertz here as a reminder. So that's the lowest frequency we want to pass. We want this to be one-tenth of that. And we just assume that the impedance was 100 ohms. We have to know what the circuit impedance is at the point we're testing to do this. So let me get my trusty calculator. And there it is. 6.28 times 100 times 2. We get a somewhat meaningless number when I hit the equal sign, but I want to take the reciprocal of that, so I hit my 1 over x button, and I got 7.96 times 10 to the minus fourth. So what does that come out to? Well, we want to move that decimal place four times. So that becomes 0 0.0007 farads, and so that would be 700 kind of big. I told you it would be big. We want a 700 microfarad capacitor. That's kind of big. And uh, so that's going to be kind of a big non-electrolytic capacitor, but that's what we calculated for this particular instance. If our impedance was different, we'd come out with a different number. But anyway, that's your calculation. So remember, if you're calculating the value of a coupling capacitor, you want the cutoff frequency of the whole circuit to be about one-tenth of the lowest frequency you want to pass. So that becomes our frequency here. And remember this formula comes from our frequency to figure out the cutoff frequency of a RC circuit. We just swapped the frequency and the capacitance and then change that to impedance. And so 1 over 2 pi ZF will give us the capacitor we want. But like I said, you're going to want a fairly big capacitor unless you're working with fairly high frequency circuits. Okay, the next thing I want to talk about is decoupling capacitors, a whole different concept. But they sound similar, so I'm bunching them together. And here's the problem. I have an oscillating circuit. And it's going to some kind of a power supply. I just represent that with a battery. And 
this oscillating circuit as it produces, well, uh, these are very common in digital circuits, so I'll say it's producing a square wave, or it's a counting circuit that has square wave inputs and square wave outputs. So we have square waves there, and as this switches around, turning on and off here, producing the oscillations or whatever it's doing, it's going to demand different amounts of current going over a wire that goes from here to here. And that wire has what? It has resistance. So I have varying amounts of current going through a resistance. So what's going to happen to the voltage that's supplying this oscillator? That voltage, of course, as I have more current go through, this voltage is going to go down. Remember, this voltage is steady. Let's say plus 10 volts. As the current goes through that resistor, the more current, the lower this voltage. And the high, less current, the higher that voltage, because as I have current go through this resistance, I have a voltage difference develop across it. And this voltage will go down. We've discussed that many times before. So as this demand goes higher and lower, our voltage is going to go up and down. It might be kind of noisy if this is a, a circuit that's doing a lot of digital work. And that could cause problems with the circuit, especially if we have a lot of these circuits pulling a lot of current. They can start, well, let's say we have another circuit over here. Let's just say it's some kind of a digital circuit. It doesn't have to be an oscillator. And so here's this power supply going to yet another circuit, which is doing its thing. And we have all this varying amount of voltage here. And this is having different demands over wire that has a certain amount of resistance. You can see we might have a problem. So what we need to do is smooth that out. How do we do it? Well, it's small fluctuations. And so, well, before I say, if that was a power supply, what would we do? We'd put in a filter. There are two possibilities. We could maybe put a coil here and put another one here or something like that. However, coils are kind of expensive, both in size and in material. What we're going to do instead is draw our power supply here again. We're going to put a little capacitor across each one of these circuits, a filter capacitor instead of a filter coil. And just like the filter capacitor in a power supply, this is going to smooth out those transitions. So instead of getting a lot of big change, we're going to get smaller changes. And that will smooth out the supply voltage for all of the circuits. So if you look at this picture here, you see here is a circuit board and it's a lot of digital circuits on there. And look next to each circuit, there's a little blue capacitor that is the decoupling capacitor. So decoupling capacitor is a completely different concept, but you can see what they do. So coupling capacitor is used to pass AC and block DC, mainly to prevent circuit loading from test equipment. So you don't want your test equipment loading down your circuit and pulling the voltages down. And decoupling capacitors are used most commonly in digital circuits across each circuit to smooth out the changes in voltage that are caused by the circuit itself as it demands more and less current. So that is coupling and decoupling capacitors in a nutshell, the basics that you need to know. So, be sure to give me a thumbs up down below, really helps the channel. And to help me put these videos online, you can go to Patreon and pledge your support. Thanks to my many patrons for making these videos possible and thanks for watching.